Well, warm greetings to you from me, Colin, here in Barton-on-Sea. I've been invited to share this reflection with you as we leave 2020 and enter into 2021. And given everything that's been going on, I thought it might be really helpful to go to a, a scripture together, which is both real and realistic, but also is hopeful and uplifting. So here's the first words of this scripture, Mark chapter 1, verse 1. The beginning of the good news. The beginning of the good news. And reading on, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it's written in the prophet Isaiah, See, I'm sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptised by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I have baptised you with water, but he will baptise you with the Holy Spirit. A scripture which leads us particularly to the idea of being in the desert or being in the wilderness beyond the Jordan, where John is located. And the experience of desert and wilderness was something very, very real to the Jewish people. They were back from being deported in Babylon. They'd been back for some while. They'd been able to see a new temple be put up, but they weren't free to be the nation before God to be in control, to use our language, and to live their lives and their faith in the ways that they would choose to, not fully because of the Romans occupying that part of the world and many other parts, of course. So for them, they were not any longer in the desert beyond Egypt, as it were, having been freed from there. They were no longer back in Babylon uh, and deported there, but they were still in the desert. They were still in exile. It was still a struggle. And all of life was affected by this experience. So no wonder there's real enthusiasm when they hear of this prophet figure, this Elijah figure, beyond the Jordan, who's bringing a, a message of getting ready, getting ready for God's Messiah, God's anointed one. Downcast in the desert might be a way of describing their ongoing experience, wanting to be free of it. Downcast in the desert might be a way of describing our experience too, as we've struggled with all that's gone on in recent months. The sheer uncertainty of it, the sheer being a, a robbed from uh, all the ways in which we would normally want to be with one another, all of those things, and of course for some of us the very real experience of illness or the illness and indeed for some of us the tragedy of someone that we love dying and uh, then it being even more difficult because saying goodbye has been so difficult in recent months. Darren Blaney writes a, a really helpful reflection about some of the psychological experiences that we've been having over the last nearly a year. It's published in the Baptist Times so you can look it up if you want to but he talks about four particular aspects. The first aspect is this that there's an anxiety of going back into the pressure cooker. And that really is about those of us that have really liked having a bit more space or having to put down some of the mad driven way in which we normally live, whether it be at work or with our family or in church, any of those things. And then the thought that we might need to go back into that makes us anxious. I heard recently of someone who was making preparations for their church and their church building to restart services. And when this person got to the threshold of their building for the very first time after some time away during lockdown, they really struggled. They got really anxious and wondered what it was about. It's the anxiety of going back into the pressure cooker. Yep. The second aspect is the heartache that comes from the loss of relationships. And I hardly need to say any more about that, but all of us have experienced that. And then it's been uh, piled on because we have huge expectations about gathering at Christmas. 
but just not being able to be with one another, however much we're grateful for uh, online contact and all of those things, we know it's not the same. The third aspect is the exhaustion of mental overload. And that's been writ large recently as well, but it's been a feature of the whole period of time. And the mental overload is about the fact that 95% of what we do, we do on autopilot. We've got established patterns. We'd have to make a fresh, big decision about something. We just get on with it and do it, whether it be what we buy in the shops, uh, who we see when, uh, uh, turning up to church, uh, whatever it happens to be. Um, There's a lot that's just built in. This last several months particularly, and this last two or three weeks uh, even more, we thought that we could make plans, we thought that we understood the new situation, and then it changed. And we live all the time with the uncertainty that it might change again in these very demanding times of disrupted travel, of a new variant of the virus, and all of those things. The exhaustion of mental overload, and just the sheer headache, literally, that we get from having to handle the uncertainty and the changes. And then finally, uh, Darren Blaney uh, draws our attention to the difficulty of not having normal ways to reduce stress. And those normal ways are going to the gym or being out with a group cycling or singing in a choir, whether it be choral or community choir. Uh, Of course, being gathered together in worship with others in a church service or in some other group that we're in with our friends who are Christians. Um, All those things that we do to just relax and enjoy the gift of one another and this extraordinary world that God has placed us in. So all of those combine to leading to a real pressure on our mental health and it's uh, there's not many people that actually haven't had some sort of mental health challenge or, or struggle over recent months downcast in the desert. So good news in that situation is welcome, isn't it? There's the good news that we anticipate around the vaccine, but we know that there's still some way to get to what that might open up for us. And in the meantime, we ask our question about what is, where is the real good news that's really going to sustain us and help us to be resilient and help us to have focus as we go into 2021. And the good news is the good news of Jesus Christ. Eugene Peterson says the good news of Jesus Christ, the message, it begins here. It begins here. And the good news of Jesus Christ is what John the Baptist was preparing for. He broadcasts the need to be ready for him, to be ready for one who is truly the Son of God, not like the Roman Emperor who claimed to be a Son of God, and not like so many leaders then and now who frankly will always be fallible and are fallible. However much they do their best, they cannot fulfil all the expectations we might have for compassion, justice, wisdom, availability, being personable, all of those things that we pile in It's not possible for human beings to fulfil every aspect of that. They're fragile and vulnerable, just like every other human being. So the longing is for someone who might not be fragile like that, although, of course, Jesus was certainly vulnerable, but although he was resilient in his calling and in his mission. So the point is to be ready for this Jesus, this Lord. And John the Baptist is quite clear what we do to be ready And that is we uh, have a change of heart and a change of orientation, a change of direction, a change of life, which is what repentance, metanoia, means. It's a change of the whole being towards God and towards God's ways. And so people throng to him and they're baptised in that particular way uh, to express that desire to be God-focused and God's ways focused as well at that time. What's interesting to me is what are the sorts of things that John the Baptist imagined were the sins that they repented of? We don't always ask that question. Well, we are given a clue. We're given a clue in the sense that he challenged Herod in terms of the uh, illicit affair that he was having. But wider than that, we know that John was particularly concerned about how those who are poor 
deprived and vulnerable are treated by those that have power and economic wealth. So, for example, uh, when we um, read in Luke 3, we find that the crowds ask John, what should we do? And he says, well, tax collectors should stop collecting deceitful wages. Soldiers should stop extorting people by force and should be content with their wages. And the crowd as a whole should give up the extra things that they possess and own in order to meet the needs of those who don't have enough. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Pretty explicit. Concern for justice and for the way that others are treated. The need to be content with what we have and to make sure that we go out of our way to help those that don't have that. That includes the way that people are treated because of their skin colour or any other reason, really. And refusing to collude with anything that treats people in that way and for those reasons. Pursuing justice, turning to God and wanting to see that as part of how we live. So uh, that's something that we can do and have done perhaps over the year. No doubt you found ways to particularly reach out to others and be of help. Perhaps you've campaigned to make sure that some people aren't forgotten. But however it is, whatever it is, this is one way of being ready for Jesus because Jesus is not just um, a personal devotional relationship. Jesus comes to, well, as he says to John as well, John the Baptist, he comes and uh, the blind receive their sight and the lame walk and the lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. This is what Jesus comes to bring. And he encourages John the Baptist in his doubts in prison, which are completely understandable. He encourages him with these words that Jesus comes to bring healing and justice and compassion and restoration. So the broadcast of good news, we're downcast in the desert, but we've got the broadcast in the wilderness, incidentally, from the wilderness, that we particularly experience God, just as God had super revealed God's self to the people of Israel when they escaped Egypt in the desert for all those years. Super revealed God's self to them when they were deported to Babylon and needed to find out a new way and fresh ways of expressing their faith away from the temple and away from Jerusalem and away from the promised land. There is another sort of uh, play on the word cast as well, and that is the way in which we are invited to be part of the drama. We're invited to be part of the play. Now, you may have played charades in recent days. Apparently, that's one of the things that you can do, and uh, you can even do it online. Um, I've never had much success with acting. Uh, the best I've got is playing the poor man gathering wood for fuel in Good King Wenceslas. That's as far as it's got. But the good news is that we can all be part of the story of God and what God is doing at this time. This passage goes on to say uh, that the leading role, the starring role, is Jesus and we're there to serve and to follow him and be inspired by him. Eugene Peterson translates John's preaching in a wonderful way when he writes. John the Baptist preached and as he did so, he said, the real action comes next. The star in this drama to whom I'm a mere stagehand will change your life. I'm baptising you here in the river, turning your old life in for a kingdom life. His baptism, a holy baptism by the Holy Spirit, will change you from the inside out. The good news as we go into 2021 is that every single one of us watching this, sharing this moment, can receive God's Holy Spirit in and through our faith and our trust in Christ. And the Holy Spirit will sustain and strengthen us to be the sort of people that we're meant to be, to be Jesus-like in the way that we show compassion and understanding and care and in the way that we seek justice for others. And it's a long obedience in the same direction. It's a persistent trust over a long period of time is the sort of faithfulness that we're invited into. 
Well, good news indeed. This is the Lord that we follow. This is the vision that we engage with of God's kingdom coming here on earth, just as it's done in heaven. And so we glimpse something of the kingdom and uh, we uh, try to not lose our sight of it. I love the poem by R.S. Thomas called The Bright Field when he writes this. Perhaps it's been your experience of catching sight of something bigger and greater than all the other things that have been real uh, but are not the last word in our recent experience. Thomas writes, I have seen the sun break through to illuminate a small field for a while and gone my way and forgotten it. But that was the pearl of great price, the one field that had treasure in it. I realise now that I'm a, I must give all that I have to possess it. Life is not hurrying on to a receding future, nor hankering after an imagined past. It is the turning aside like Moses to the miracle of the lit bush, to a brightness that seemed as transitory as your youth once, but is the eternity that waits you. The glimpse of something bigger, something greater. Good news indeed. The good news of Jesus Christ coming to us in and from and through the wilderness, despite our struggle. And so a prayer as we conclude our time together. A very brief prayer. And it's a prayer also a blessing. Now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may abound in hope.